Um, my name is Ewan Murray. I'm the Chief Executive of the Sustainability Consortium. I'm acutely aware that the three of us stand between you and the coffee break, so we will uh, try and make this light, and if we can't do that, we'll make it quick. Um, we have the topic this morning of the transparency dilemma. I guess we, we probably all know that feeling where we accidentally share too much information. Um, in my experience, that tends to happen at the drinks reception after the end of the conference. Um, but it's something that applies equally in the business context. In this move for, for more data, for extra disclosure, there are surely limits on what it makes sense to share and with whom. So we've two fantastic speakers with us this morning, Andrew McConville from Syngenta and Rachel Everard from Rolls-Royce. The way this will work, we have about 40 minutes or so, and we'll start just with a conversation among us on stage, and then we'll fire up Slido, and you'll have a chance to, to put questions to, to us and lead us through to the coffee break. So we're gonna launch right in. Um, I wanna start broadly before we, we delve into the topic specifically and, and ask you both, what is a holistic, transparent disclosure strategy? What does that look like? And, and what's the, the business rationale for diving in? <laughs> nice narrow question to start with. Um, I, I, I think increasingly we have to um, recognize that the expectations between, I, I think, what what society is, is, is demanding of us and what, as a corporation, we are prepared to um, disclose is actually diverging. Um, and even within organisations, I think there's... You know, I, I spend a lot of my time you know, arguing with the senior executive about the need to be more transparent. Um, and, and, and I said this yesterday because transparency builds trust. So when we look at... Uh, you know, an, an approach to transparency and reporting and how do we do that, I, I think, and it builds a little bit on what was just said in the previous panel, it, it has to be completely integrated. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we've actually moved, we don't produce an annual report uh, as such anymore. Um, it, it's, it's, I can't remember the exact terminology, but it's, it's, a, it's an integrated report across uh, financials, across uh, community and social engagement, across uh, sustainability, uh, and across sort of future pipeline and future developments. So we actually see that as a really key vehicle for um, you know, telling the story, if you like. I think part of the problem is, at least in our industry, in the agricultural industry, um, we haven't been particularly good at defining what that story actually is. And, and you know, we're an R&D organisation and the general response for us is, if only we throw more science at it, uh, people will understand. And as we were just discussing before, you and that's absolutely not the case. You know, it's not about the science at all. Um, it's actually about the perception of, of, of how people see you telling your story. So um, we've tried to work a lot towards a completely integrated approach. Um, we also uh, make sure that when we publish, um, that we're publishing all of our results, financial sustainability, again, as, as an integrated whole, but then also a process of, of continuous reporting through the year. What's interesting for us is that uh, Syngenta, we were a publicly listed company. We were listed in Zurich and, and the US, and we were recently bought by ChemChina, uh, which is a Chinese state-owned enterprise. So we were actually privatised uh, last year. And yet the expectations for us to continue reporting remain really, really high. And, and we have a really interesting tension in our own organisation of how much is enough. And thankfully, we've erred on the side of continuing to report way more than as a private company we're actually required to do because our social licence to operate uh, is, is as important as, as our economic uh, and environmental licence to operate. And, you know, interestingly, the tension hasn't come. A lot of people say, well, it's because you're now owned by the Chinese that, you know, you, you might want to look at the way in which you report. Actually, the Chinese have been, in, in many ways, our owners uh, wanting us to be more transparent and actually report more and be more open um, because of the issues and the challenges that they have there as well. So we haven't seen that as a, as, a, as a problem. The only thing that's changed for us is we've gone from a quarterly reporting cycle to a six-monthly reporting cycle. Um, and again, each time, it's the full suite of... Uh, you know, sustainability, financials, operations, and so on, right across the board. So, if anything, 
we are seeing that we have to do more, not less, um, and that is creating some tension in the organisation in terms of well, what does more actually mean. But I think slowly we are starting to win that discussion and battle internally as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Rachel? Um, yeah, so uh, Rolls-Royce is a FTSE 100 company, so we produce an annual report with our sustainability metrics integrated into that report. But I think the, the transparency conversation goes beyond annual reporting. It, it's really about across your digital and other channels and your, your dialogue with your stakeholders as well. And that's something that we've been investing a lot in recently is particularly our social media platforms where we're growing a, a huge audience that are not just interested in technology and innovation, but also in what we're doing from a social or environmental or ethical perspective. Um, so we're seeing a lot of growth in sustainability communication and dialogue with, with stakeholders through those kind of channels, which I mean, my social media is quite different from how I might engage corporately. So it, it, there's a different language and a different expectation, I think, as well on organizations. Um, we are a B2B company, so I think that brings slightly like, different challenges. We're not typically engaging directly with our customers who are large airlines and other large organizations. They're not really the cons mass consumer market. Um, but at the same time, we have the challenge of being a very well-known name, a household name. Um, Maybe not for quite the same product as actually we do the cars, it's separate from aerospace. But, um, but yeah, that has a level of expectation that you're going to be doing the best you can and sort of disclosing as much as you can as well. Great. It's interesting you both touch on that idea of, of the, the changing requirements over time. You know, what influence has the internet had? Is social media having on what you produce, when and, and how? there's a very different expectation. I mean, if you think about your annual report, it's a PDF document. Who, how, who and how many people actually read that? Um, and it pains me to say that because I spend a lot of my time on that document and probably one of the few people that read it cover to cover. Um, but actually, digital platforms, you know, it's, it's a very quick response. Um, it's very rapid. It's kind of live and now. Um, so you're expected to respond to something that happens in the, in the news or in the media, whether or not that's directly to do with your company. Um, and I think that's, that's very different from the annual report that takes six months to produce. Yeah, uh, entirely, entirely the same. I mean, we, we, we use the annual report, and, and as I said, it's an integrated, so it contains all that sustainability reporting as well, as a bit of a, a, a marker which helps us then set a narrative for the 12 months. But, I mean, the internet and social media has changed uh, enormously the way we engage. I mean, again, we're a B2B company. We sell pesticides and seeds to wholesalers who sell to retailers to sell to farmers. So we're actually quite removed from the end customer. And yet the amount of social media that we have to do to engage with, with farmers, with NGOs, with, with other sectors of the community is, is absolutely enormous. And it, it is a, a, a continuous um, conversation. And it's, it's designed mainly, I think, to provide a bit of a halo effect, uh, as in we still have to have, we're, we're a highly regulated industry, so we still have to have all the regulatory and policy conversations, but by, by engaging through social media particularly, and, and generally we use, we use Twitter, we use Facebook, um, and we use YouTube, so it's nothing, it's, it's nothing terribly innovative, but it's a continuous conversation. That starts to build a level of trust, which is then extremely important when we go in to have regulatory and policy conversations. Um, so it's, it's absolutely essential to, to our business. And, and you know, for us, farmers are uh, huge users of social media, uh, even poor countries, Bangladesh, India, um, China. You know, there's 460 million uh, you know, sign of Weibo users in, in China, and most of them are farmers. So um, you know, we have to get involved in that conversation. And most of it is, um, it's fairly inane sort of stuff, but you just, as Rachel was saying, you've just got to be responsive and you've got to be present, you've got to be visible, and it's a continuous conversation. And a lot of our dialogue on social media is about sustainability issues because that's where the deficit of trust is between you know, our company and or our industry and, and society so a lot of it is about sustainability issues right. and and um, is it a, is it a competitive space are you sort of vying for share of voice there with you know your corporate customers and your your corporate customers corporate customers or is it something that that you as a supply chain 
are sort of talking in, in unison, um, all singing from the same hymn sheet as you go out and talk to farmers or to airline customers or, or, or whomever? I, th I think it's some and some. Uh, I mean, we certainly do look to use, so I mentioned yesterday, we have a thing called the Good Growth Plan, which is our s sort of commitments to sustainability, and we see that absolutely as a competitive differentiator, um, both in terms of uh, the ultimate customer, the farmers, but also in terms of policy makers and regulators. It allows us to have a different conversation. It allows us to create partnerships with NGOs um, that give us competitive advantage. So there is absolutely a competitive piece in there. Um, but that said, we do also, we have an industry association called CropLife. We do also look to manage uh, a number of issues through the industry associations as well. Um, but you inevitably end up in a lowest common denominator approach. And, that, and that's not a criticism of crop life or indeed the industry, but it, it's driven by consensus. So it's, it's the big, uh, you know, monolithic type issues that tend to get dealt with there. Yeah. Um, and then we continue to run our own race as, as well. But we do see that the way in which we engage uh, around, or transparently engage around sustainability issues is principally, I would say, a point of, of competitive differentiation. Not necessarily advantage, but certainly differentiation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great, thanks. Rachel. Yeah, I think it, for us it's the same, it's a bit of both. I think the aerospace industry itself is quite unique in that it, it's very, um, it's a very integrated supply chain. So our product goes on someone else's airframe with it, someone else flies as an airliner, and then ultimately the customer is a passenger. So we can't speak in isolation because our products aren't used in isolation. You can't actually get very far with a jet engine if it's not attached to something. So uh, that we need to have that holistic kind of industry perspective. Um, but there are areas where it's, it's a differentiator, and we might talk about something in a very different way from our, our competitors or peers. Yeah. Great, thank you. And, and you're both huge businesses, you, you both sell all around the world. Um, Andrew, you talked a, a bit about China, the, you know, the farmer, but, but also your owners. How, does, how are these issues playing out differently in, in different geographies, in different markets? Um, I think I, I would differentiate China from the, the uh, other parts of Asia, particularly I think one of the great things about China, and I would say this whether we were owned by the Chinese or not, is you know, they have this, this, this wonderful capability for long-term vision and planning. I mean, they operate on a series of five-year plans. So um, they do tend to take the longer view, and, and part of their long view under the 13th five-year plan is to address um, many of the really complex environmental issues coming out of agriculture and food production. So overuse of pesticides, overuse of fertilisers, contamination of water and soil, um, uh, you know, and, and then also carbon emissions for which agriculture contributes about 30%. So you know, they've taken the view that we need to address agriculture in order to address these environmental challenges. So it's very high on their agenda. I think in some other parts of, of, of the less developed world, it's less of a priority because farmers are mostly interested in feeding themselves. And, and generally what happens is in, in farming communities around the world, the first thing a farmer does is feed his family, then send his kids to school, then invest more in technology to improve yield and profitability, and then maybe start to think about the environment. So they've got to go through that cycle, and that's a bit mixed. Um, Africa, parts of India, parts of less developed Southeast Asia, um, I think they're still focused on how do we just grow enough to eat and send our kids to school. I think in developed markets like the US, like Europe, um, where I'm from in Australia, absolutely it's um, environmental issues are incredibly large on the horizon. And uh, you know, all agricultural companies, uh, and oh, in fact all food value chain companies are, are looking at ways in which we need to improve uh, performance and how do we use technology in order to allow us to do that. And that's consistent across the board. So pockets of less developed countries, not there yet, but more broadly, let's say developed agriculture, developed food production, um, it's a huge priority regardless of, 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 of systems. And then it's just about what technologies do you use to deliver that. Great, thank you. Rachel, you see something similar? Uh, yeah, but I think, I think we probably see less regional differentiation, I suppose. Um, although I would say that some countries or, or geographies prioritise different issues. Um, so we may talk more openly about employee well-being in the Nordics, for example, mm. than we might do in India as an example. Um, I think politically there's some kind of drivers to that. I mean, we are not admittedly shouting that much about carbon impact in the US at the moment because it's, it's not going down very well. Um, but yeah, so I think we have a consistent global message. We just may prioritise different 
subjects, yes, depending on stakeholders. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know the extent to which you'll, you'll be able to answer this, but um, to what extent is the local political context important for when and how you disclose? I guess I was struck earlier this week by the different responses to the publication of the latest IPCC report on, on climate, that we've basically got 12 years to, to fix it or be on a, a pathway to fixing it. In some parts of the world, that had huge um, support from, from governments. In other parts, uh, the US, the UK, even Australia, there was a sort of deathly silence. Does, does that play out in practical terms for you guys? Or is it just something that kind of happens there behind the scenes and, and you just get on with what you were going to do? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. I'm not sure I really have, have a clear answer other than it, it, it definitely differs by, by region. As Rachel said, you know, sometimes you've got to be a little bit politically savvy in terms of the message you want to push in the US at the moment opposite of what we might push here in, 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 in Europe. Um, for us, I think people do see that agriculture is a huge contributor to the impact of climate change. And it's interesting, it goes two ways. It's agriculture's impact on climate change and climate change's impact on agriculture. And, and that's quite a different conversation depending on, on, on where you sit on that. Um, so we, we absolutely get involved, um, but in some ways it's almost too difficult politically for people to understand how we can actually use you know, agriculture as a tool to improve environmental outcomes. There's still a, people haven't been able to make the sort of the cognitive shortcut between if you improve uh, the performance of agriculture and you, and you look at the way in which you produce food, you can address these issues. That hasn't fully happened yet and often we find ourselves in a position where we have to sort of lead policy makers to that outcome so they don't fully understand it yet. They'll talk about it in large views of, you know, agriculture impacts on climate change, right, but what is it that we actually need to address? The, the level of sophistication of that conversation I don't think is there yet. Great, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's a tricky tricky conversation at the moment. I think for us, we do a lot of our engagement through industry bodies, whether those are regional or global, and then the, the voice doesn't change depending on where you are in the world, and you have all the, the big players around the table, and, and it helps to be able to put forward a consistent um, industry perspective on, on some of these topics. Um, like I said before, we, we may change our focus slightly in different regions, and, and particularly with different governments or, or other stakeholders but it doesn't kind of change what we're doing, it just might change what we talk about. It's a, it's a good point, actually. I mean, we, we, I think a little bit the same. So, you know, where we're talking about smallholder farms, so Africa, Asia, China, um, it's more about the impact of climate change on those producers, as in their ability to produce food. Um, in the developed markets, it's about the impact of agriculture on climate change, so it, it, it does shift. Great, great. Um, you both have have roles where effectively you're the, the, the internal champion, the eternal evangelist for, for these topics. I thought that might make you smile. Yeah. Um, uh, but but you're, 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 you're the cheerleader for that in the organization. I imagine in, in some cases that feels like you're, you're leading a, a happy band. In other cases, you're pushing water uphill. You know, where, how does that play out when it comes to, to transparency? Um, you know, when is it, when is being when are you when do you risk being too transparent? Um, how do you know when you're getting to that point? And and how can you make sure you always protect the protect the company, protect the brand at the same time as admitting your failures or the things you haven't got to yet, Rachel? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I have a very close working relationship with our communications and brand department um, and I'll go to them and I'll say we really ought to be talking about this topic and they'll say no you can't or let's let's come up with a way of talking about that in a way that's not going to damage the brand. I think Rolls Royce is perhaps quite unique in that we have had as most people will know in recent history um, uh, you know we're on, under a deferred prosecution agreement we've had some ethical issues in the past and that has really given us a big kick up the backside in terms of our transparency and disclosure around ethics topics um, which has helped to engage the board and our executive leadership team and get them to really understand and see the value in being transparent as far as possible um, and then that has then trickled across our broader sustainability agenda um, and I think so this, 
sorry, regulatory changes have helped with that, but also there's just the growing NGO and external stakeholder expectations that you're more transparent. Um, I mean, I'm in the process of completing the Workforce Disclosure Initiative Assessment, if anyone's familiar with that one, which is all around how you manage workforce issues in your business and in your supply chain. Um, and it's really challenging us to think a bit differently about the data that we currently collect and report. Um, are we reporting the right metrics? And those kind of assessments and initiatives and calls to action really help to energize us. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, it always comes down to dollars. It's, you, you've got to be able to identify a dollar impact of either the benefits of doing this or the risk if you don't. Um, so, for example, in our European business, um, at the moment we have about $1.2 billion of product at risk of not getting re-registered. Okay, so um, how do you then ensure your freedom and your licence to operate in order to, to be able to, to get those products re-registered? That tends to sharpen the mind of the executive to, to, to get this done. And, and then once you establish what's at risk, then you say, okay, well, here's part of the solution. And part of the solution is that we have to address this disconnect between what society expects in terms of agricultural productivity and, and, and what we can actually deliver. Um, but it's always got to come back to um, either hard dollar benefit or reputation risk. And reputation risk in the context of, you know, the executive has to hear it firsthand. I mean, I can... Uh, I, I can push and push and push and push to the point of almost being career limiting um, in, in order to try and get the message across and then you get one outside uh, stakeholder comes in and says well you know you should be doing this and you've just got to so resist the temptation and say I told you so, I told you so. <laughs> um, but that's just the reality, you know senior executives are inevitably doubting Thomases and so you, I think you've just got to end up being a little bit smart as to how do you get, so establish the dollar impact, absolutely, establish the reputation risk, absolutely and then get it reinforced with, with external voices. And they can be positive or, or negative. I mean, we, we just announced um, at the end of August a, a series of global listening sessions around the future of sustainable food production. And you know, as part of that, at least I got the CEO to say, okay, every member of the Syngenta executive team will have to participate in at least two listening sessions so that they start to hear it firsthand. Yeah. Um, and then you know, we, we, we gather that feedback and, it's, re it's really quite interesting. You know, the, the first session, we've actually got my first um, executive presentation next Wednesday, and in, in trying to set that up, I've been talking one by one to the senior execs, and, and all of a sudden they're going, oh, yeah, you know, in my listening session I heard this, and you just go, oh, for God's sake, I've been telling you that for years. Um, but until they hear it firsthand, until they see the dollar impact, you're just never going to get that shift. And so I think as, as communicators and as sustainability uh, agents, we have to be smart in terms of how do we create the circumstances which allow these people to experience it firsthand, both negative and positive as well. You know, sometimes it's great to get a positive message, but you've got to try and engineer those situations because if you don't, you just you're beating your head against the wall, and you're never going to get the traction that you need. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say that. You know, the the old business adage that if you can't get get approval for a project, hire McKinsey and get them yeah. to tell your boss. Yeah. I guess the same sort of logic applies with WWF and EDF and the like oh, when it, it comes to this one. Absolutely. I mean, you know, yeah. our, our CEO, I won't, I won't name the particular NGO, but was, was met with a very, very senior NGO last week and he's come back and gone, oh, we need to do this now. And it's like, oh, man, you know, <laughs> we've been telling you that. So you, you do, and, and I think that that adds real traction to, to your agenda. And as we were discussing just before we came on, I think the other thing is you need to be able to also monetize it almost down to a product level. So, for example, when we talk about our good growth plan, how do we, how do we use the good growth plan as part of our marketing uh, for particular products? As in, if you, um, you know, if you purchase this product, we can improve smallholder productivity, or we can improve biodiversity, or we can reduce. Uh, soil degradation, you've got to start to get it into the commercial business in that way, otherwise you're never going to get traction. And it will always be seen just as a sustainability initiative or an external affairs initiative or whatever. And, you know, if, if you're in that space, you haven't made it yet, it, it's got to be seen as this is fundamental to the commercial success of our business. And once you get to that point, then you're going to get traction. Good. I, I want to build on something you said, Andrew, and a, a question for both of you. Um, Andrew, you mentioned that idea of the, the dollar impact, but also the reputational impact. And um, 
I guess as you were, were talking there, uh, it just made me think of uh, you know one of your competitors around licensing, getting glyphosate relicensed in in the European Union, mm -hmm. and that's an interesting framework because you know I, I imagine they were looking at short term dollar impact, euro impact, saying we have to get this through or we, we're, we're going to lose out in the short term. Yeah. But then the longer term brand impact is potentially negative. How do you how do you trade off those things? When, when they don't go hand in hand? Because sometimes they do, but often they don't. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, certainly in that situation, I think they've, they've got some indigestion over, over you know, getting that product to market uh, a second time. I, I, it's just persistence. I think you've just got to continuously try and highlight uh, the risk, and, and you've got to just be, be prepared to get those third-party voices to come in and talk with you um, and just be absolutely singularly bloody minded about it to make it happen because you know and, and the thing with reputation risk is, is, is really interesting it's very hard to value before the incident actually happens it's only afterwards you know and, and this I told you so situation um, but I, I think you've just got to have that firm belief you've got to stand by it and look some you'll win and some you'll lose but I think you, you've just you've got to continuously just really stand by it and get others to highlight the risk. And I think for us in our industry, getting governments and policymakers to say, you play down this path, this is not going to work, that's when it really starts to get traction because at the end of the day, we're about registering products. Um, I don't think there's any easy answer. I don't think there's any magic bullet that makes it happen apart from just being dogged in your determination to make it happen. Great. Rachel, do you want to take that or should I give you one from Slido? Yeah, I'll have another one. <laughs> okay, great. Um, we've covered a couple, I think probably the, the first two actually, um, hopefully the, the people asking those think we covered those earlier on, but um, you know, Rachel, so what's your opinion on the risk of abusing transparency? We heard this a little bit in the previous session too, that if there's just a flood of information, it's difficult to, to get insight from it. Can you hide bad results uh, just in a, in, a, in, a, in a whole data dump? How, how should we all think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's around the stories that you tell. And I think for us, it's about being selective with the, the message, what is the key message you want to get across? I, I don't think you should ever hide bad results in, in, in a data dump, and, and yeah, that's not something that I would ever advocate for. Um, I think if we take the annual report example, we only have a, such a limited space. It really is about what's your key, your material messages that you want to get across um, with data so, to substantiate your biggest impacts. Um, assured data, I would say as well. I think that's pretty fundamental. Um, and the relevant targets, long-term metrics in place. Um, across your broader channels, I think you can choose a slightly different message of suitable for your audience. What you post on LinkedIn might be quite different from what you post on Instagram, obviously, a picture, but also from Facebook or something. You're appealing to a different audience, and I think that's really important. You, you might be saying the consistent messaging, but it's going to be in a different guise or in a different language almost, depending on who your audience is. I, I, I don't think you can, I mean, generally, and it is a generalisation, I, I don't think you can lose by being more transparent, to be honest. Um, you know, it's interesting, some of the feedback we're getting through these listening sessions at the moment is, you know, you need to be more transparent. We're thinking, oh, you know, we've, we've just about given you everything anyway, and they're saying, no, you, you still want more. So I think in general, and, and if you're doing the right thing and you have the right story to tell, you, you're never going to be harmed by being transparent, I don't think. Great. So... Keep that thought when I ask you the next one. You know, uh, how does that play out when you when there's a negative story, when you have a new product that hasn't worked, or there's uh, there's a challenge that your peers are tackling and you haven't got to yet? How how do you maintain transparency um, and yet communicate in a way that the business is comfortable with? Yeah, it make your lawyers really nervous. Um, I, I think, you've, you've, again, you've got to approach it with honesty. If you screw up, say we screwed up, you know? Um, I mean, what's, as I say, I know the lawyers get, get very nervous about that, but at the end of the day, um, you, know, you actually get more credibility for admitting your mistakes and then saying, people will forgive a mistake as long as you don't make it twice. Yeah. And, and people will forgive a mistake as long as you say, okay, we made a mistake, we understand we've made a mistake, and this is what we're going to do to fix it. And I think that's really the key. And, and you know, we... Um, we, we had an issue a couple of years ago in, in, in Brazil where we introduced a fabulous uh, fungicide product 
And of course, one of the issues with introducing a great product is farmers will use it and use it and use it, and then you end up and you get resistance. And you know, that was our mistake. We, we weren't in a position where we actually educated the farmers to say, well, you need to use this in a series of crop rotations. You need to use this uh, in a way that manages resistance. And you know, that was an expensive lesson to learn for us, yeah. you know, financially and, and, and reputationally. And I think you've just got to be prepared to say, look, we didn't, we didn't get it right. And, and universally, my experience with, with NGOs, NGOs will give you credit uh, and, and NGOs are, we, we have a very love-hate relationship with, with, with NGOs and they, they're really the groups that hold us to account because you know, food production, agriculture is, is a pretty emotional subject. Um, but they will give you credit if, 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 if you admit that you've made mistakes and, and you're doing something about it. Uh, I think where the real risk to your reputation comes is if you try and cover it up yeah. um, or you don't do anything about it once it's been brought to your attention. Um, and, and, you know, I just wish that more companies had the courage to say, geez, I'm, I'm really sorry, we got it wrong. And, and, and we've made a mistake, and this is what we're going to do to fix it. Good. The cover-up is worse than the crime. Absolutely. <laughs> I think Every it's, time. About, it's about owning your story. Yeah. And it's about, yeah, saying, yeah, we, we messed up here, but I think it's what you're going to do to fix it. Yeah. Setting out and being held to account on what you're doing to fix it, I think, is key as well. And, and, and if you really believe in what you're doing, then you should be able to do that, you know. Um, and, and, and your conviction should stand. Great, thank you. Um, really great question. It's taken me three reads to, to actually understand what's being asked here from, from our uh, anonymous uh, colleague. Um, Rachel, can, can transparency negatively impact uh, risk-taking and leadership in sustainability, um, or risk-taking and, and, and innovation and leadership more broadly in the business? Um, that's a really good question. I think it comes back again to what is your key messages. There are obviously areas that we're not going to disclose our jet technology, for example, that we're not going to be transparent in that respect, but, but we will be transparent with certain parts of our business and, and the way we operate. And I, I think it comes back to that. the way you operate. I think most companies should be completely transparent about, you know, again, it's not exactly what, sorry. Um, I think in terms of policy making and approach and strategy, I think it's very important to be transparent. Um, but there are areas that we would not publicly disclose and there's areas that we wouldn't share with our competitors and peers. Um, but I don't, so there's obviously, there's always gonna be a balance between risk and return. But I think in the most, most sense, the return is more valuable. So it, it, it's a big debate here in Europe at the moment. Um, where some of you might be aware there's a committee being run at the moment looking at uh, the way in which uh, crop protection dossiers are put forward and, and, and how open they should be. And um, you know, I, I think a lot of that information can be, uh, can be shared. And, and in fact, you know, even, even when we register a product and we have a patent on it, I mean, the information that, that goes to make up that product is, is actually reasonably well available. So um, I think, as Rachel says, there needs to be a balance because you, you have to be able to obtain a return on investment to allow innovation to actually occur. I mean, in our situation, it takes 10 to 12 years and 150 to 200 million dollars to develop a new active ingredient. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to generate a return by protecting that intellectual property mm -hmm. for a period. Um, but you know, once it, once it comes off patent, the generics have a field day with it and, and we then have to adopt a different approach. So I think there is a trade-off to make sure that you continue to get innovation um, and investment, uh, but then, you know, equally, we have to understand that, that, that people perhaps also want to know. So it, 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 it's inevitably going to be a balancing trade-off. Great, thank you. I think probably our final question from Slido here. Um, oh, where's, there we are. Uh, are you aware of, uh, in the, the human rights and, and labor rights space, standardized KPIs for your industry or, or cross-industry that, that companies in the room should be looking at and adopting? I don't know who wants to take that first. I'm not aware of anything that would apply to our industry. I think um, it's a hugely growing area of interest externally and internally, human rights, I think, triggered perhaps by the Modern <coughs> Slavery Act, but that's one, one parameter. Um, so it's something we're investing quite a lot of resource in at the moment. It's really understanding what uh, topics our external audience are interested in, but also what is most relevant for us as a business as well. Um, so no, I don't have anything I can point to. But Good question. In our industry, um, child labour on farm is, is, is a big, big issue, and that's, that's a delicate one as well, because farmers will often um, have their children work on farm, and that's a different scenario to having child labour on farm. 
Um, but we, we struck up a partnership with the Fair Labor Association under the ILO um, about 10, 11 years ago, and, and we actually in our industry became the first company to be a full-time member of the FLA. And so we are randomly audited regularly across the world. Um, we've also embedded it into our own code of conduct. So we have three and a half, four thousand, in fact, it may be more, uh, seed growing farms around the world. And to be a Syngenta seed growing farm, you also have to comply with the Syngenta code of conduct, which means no child labor on farm. You are subject to independent audit by the FLA. And that's been a really productive um, and valuable relationship, and I think it's it's driven a lot of the right behaviours. We're not there yet. I think our last count was that 86% um, of both seed farms and manufacturing facilities uh, were fully compliant. That's nowhere near good enough, but at least we're transparent in terms of the journey that we're making. And it's been very, very productive for us to have that relationship, and other members of the industry are now also working with the FLA because um, often it's a very... It's a very difficult societal challenge to understand the drivers as to why um, these things happen on, on farms. And, and the FLA and, and, and associated NGOs are often much better placed to help us understand how to deal with these issues uh, and put in place implementation plans. So it's, not a, it's never a name and shame exercise. Yeah. It's, a, it, it, it's a name and improve exercise. And that's been really, really helpful and productive. And you know, I mean, long, long may it continue. Good, yeah. I, I know that that's hard. I grew up on a farm in, in the southern part of Scotland and, and my job as a kid was always making sure there were logs for the fire. Mm -hmm. And I know if I go home now, I don't get fed until I've been and checked and, and chopped whatever needs to be chopped. So uh, I don't think that counts in this no. context, but uh, um, that wasn't a cry for help there, but uh, it's important to <laughs> yeah. recognise that. But, but, but I do think, I mean, you know, I, I think you've also got to look at the fundamental drivers and in fact the best response is, is actually to support uh, farmers sending their kids to school. Exactly. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. that's rule number one, and then everything else will take care of itself after that. But, you know, I think you've got to find... This is where this is where corporates and NGOs have to be much smarter in the way in which they work together, because this is not a problem that we or the rest of our industry can solve on its own, whereas we, with the FLA, the ILO and other organisations, we can actually solve this problem. So, um, you know, I, I just wish there was more scope for... Um, a little less of this and a little bit more of this um, with you know, different players in the food value chain to make it work. Okay, great. Final question. Time to name and shame. Who is, internally, who is your easiest colleague to get on board with the new transparency initiative and who's the hardest? Andrew. <laughs> um, the CFO has been fabulous. He's been yeah. really, really good. Um, and, and again, I, I think he had one of those doubting Thomas moments and uh, you know, all of a sudden the lights turned on and he realised that there was value in this thing and, and he's become a huge evangelist. Um, I think uh, legal counsel is always difficult and, and I understand why, um, but you know, that's, that's always a far more challenging conversation uh, at, the, at the executive level. Um, I, I'd say that'd be the, the, the two. Great, thank you. Rachel? Um, I think the easiest is actually our chairman. Our board chairman is um, a great advocate for more transparency. I'm very nervous, I think, about the kind of external factors that might impact his chairmanship. Um, so he's a great advocate and a, and a really useful person to have in your corner. Um, and I, I must say that. I think um, it's difficult to, to shame, but I would say perhaps our technology part of our business is actually the most reluctant to be transparent. Um, and most wary, I suppose, of how that, that message might get portrayed externally. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you for all your questions to, to all of you in the audience. Um, let's thank our panellists, please, and coffee outside.